So can I welcome everybody to day four of Marks and Festival? And thank you everybody for coming to this quite early meeting on day four. Um, my name is Moira Samuels. Um, I am a long-standing member of the Socialist Workers' Party. I am a community, in, Grenfell impacted community activist and still part of, um, as a community member of fighting for justice for Grenfell. And before I introduce our speakers and um, talk about, um, I'm sure people are familiar, you stay for of Marxism, how the meetings work, but I'll still remind you. Um, we have a panel of three speakers, all housing activists. Um, our third panelist is on her way. Um, but before they speak, um, I'm going to say um, a little bit about Grenfell. Um, just to, uh, uh, I'm going to take the liberty as a chair, sorry. Um, I live 300 meters from Grenfell Tower. Um, I was there on the night of the fire. It is something I will never forget for the rest of my life. Um, we have a um, quite traumatized community, and I'm saying this, I'm understating it. Um, you know, as we have to remind both the state and the local authority that trauma doesn't have a sell by date. And six years on, we know we haven't got over it and it hasn't gone away. Um, I think this year was particularly tough because for many people, there was a focus on the public inquiry and that's what they focused on. You know, the day-to-day -day revelations, um, the revelations of corporate greed, the revelations of lies, of corruption, of government ministers who ignored recommendations from the Lacanal fire in 2008, which if they'd taken account of it, Grenfell would not have happened and we have, would not have lost 72 plus lives. Um, so this year was particularly tough because the inquiry finished November last year. Um, and the report to the second phase of the inquiry will only be apparently um, issued in early spring 2024. So we, we will be going into the seventh year after the fire before we only get the report from the inquiry. And that means people are still waiting for the start of the criminal investigation. And just to make clear to people, there were three demands from the, from the get-go after the fire, truth, justice, and change. As I said, for many people, um, justice, if I put it quite simply for many people, because it's quite a complex area, what does justice mean? I, shall, I call for revolutionary justice and a change of the system, because we're not going to get justice. But for most of the commu impacted community, justice means jail time. We cannot yeah. allow this to happen to a working class community of predominantly Muslim background and for no one to be held accountable. So this is what is holding the community together in terms of their focus. But we also need change. We need a change to everything related to housing. And for us, the first focus is fire safety. Um, we know that actually Grenfell impacted or reveal the impact of dangerous materials on buildings, not just for a, a council tower block, but for thousands of families, leaseholders right across the country. So this is an ongoing national crisis. Um, and the, the government has not done much in terms of change. You know, inquiries give you recommendations. They are not mandatory. Um, and the LFB have implemented most of their recommendations, but the state or the government or the local council, whoever's responsible has not. 
We still do not have retrofitted sprinklers. We don't have alarms in buildings. We're still fighting about a single staircases in um, tower blocks, which obviously impact on people's ability to evacuate. So this is where we are, but we have continued to receive solidarity from you know, a range of trade unions at the silent march on 14th of June. We had a huge contingent of the firefighters while well, wearing this t-shirt, um, the unison um, unite, and we continue to have support from all the housing campaigns. So um, don't forget about Grenfell, still an ongoing fight. Thank you. So our meeting today is called Radical Solutions to the Housing Crisis. We've got three speakers. Um, after each speaker, each speaker will speak for 10 minutes, and then I'll open the meeting to questions and contributions. Um, our first speaker is Morag Gilly. Morag is a long-standing member of Socialist Workers Party. She is the co-chair of Islington um, Homes for All, and she's the chair of the National Homes for All organization. Welcome, Morag. Right, thanks everybody. Um, think about it, we are living in one of the richest countries in the world, and yet we're facing a massive housing crisis. We can see over the decades, housing has been creating massive wealth, but for the majority of people in this country, it's, you know, it's just not accessible. Um, and you've seen even major organisations like Crisis Shelter, they're calling out for mass house building, genuinely affordable housing. So not only do we need large scale housing built, but we also look at the conditions now that people are being forced to live in. Um, you know, it's unbelievable. 2020, a two year old boy, a wee boy called um, Abab Ish Ishak, he died, he was two years old, he died from a respiratory condition, which was caused by extensive mould and damp in the one bedroom housing association flat that he was living in. You know, this is the reality for hundreds of thousands of people in this country. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not just about what we need, it's what we've got now, poor housing, that impacts on people's well-being, it impacts on their health, and we all know it is impacting massively on climate change. And, you know, how we're going to get this change? You'll, we know that the Tories, they've created this problem. It's been gr grown for decades. You know, you go back to Margaret Thatcher and you saw the death knell of council housing with the beginning of, of a right to buy. But the Labour Party, I mean, they have just been appalling, you know, um, the leadership last year, they were asked to support um, a rent and um, service charge freeze. They said they wouldn't do it. Um, Lisa and Andy now is backtracking on opposing right to buy. And in fact, she's promoting the notion of shared ownership, which we know is not accessible to the majority of private renters or people on low pay so who do we look to we look to us we are the only people you know the whole of marxism has been saying that the working class are the only people sort of capable of fighting for a better society and fighting for for decent housing and you know the height the fight for decent housing is rooted in movements from below i just want to give a bit of a sort of historical context you know you go to 1914 when the world was plunged into the most terrific and brutal war which caused the death of millions of soldiers and civilians you know what was the war about it was about fighting over land who owned bits of land but you know as we all know the opposition to the war spread across europe um and you know also in britain there was massive unrest 
and people, you know, that were no longer prepared to return to the norm, to return to the slum dwellings that they and their parents have lived in. And I just want to give you a bit of a flavour of the impact of the unrest. This is um, um, from a government board official writing in August 1917. And he said, the money that we are going to spend on housing is insurance against Bolshevism and revolution. And I think that kind of demonstrates, you know, how we, the working class, can put the fear of God into the state and we can, you know, also force change. So, you know, sort of during the first and, you know, during the first and second world war and afterwards, we saw massive council house building. And alongside that, we saw, you know, the growth of the organized working class, the development of um, skilled workers. But also with that development, it meant that we needed more land to build um, more, more housing. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to lose my thread. Um, and I came across this bit of um, legislation. This is from 1961, and it actually gave councils the power to buy land uh, from landowners. Um, and this was, you know, it didn't matter whether the landowners didn't want it. They, the local authorities had the power to, to buy up the land with the intention of building um, good quality, decent homes that were, you know, sort of looked at the needs of uh, the local community. You know, as I say, along the, alongside that, we saw the beginning of the growth of the shop stewards movement. We saw workers' <coughs> confidence, a really strong militant uh, rank and file. And that confidence obviously spilled out of the workplace into the communities and society at large. So, you know, during that period, we're seeing an you know, economic boom. But even you know, the ruling classes, they couldn't solve themselves. Even, you know, they were always looking to take away what they gave with one hand um, and, you know, take back the concessions that they made. So that legislation was quickly changed and it meant that local authorities had to pay the premium market prices on that land uh, on the basis of anticipation of building luxury flats. Obviously, they had no intention of building luxury flats. It was about council housing. And it's at that period we see real rise in high-rise flats and, you know, poor quality housing. So, as I say, we saw in recent decades, you know, the ruling classes moving from defence really to an unrestrained and offensive against the working class and during that period, we saw, you know, our side beginning to, to ebb. And it's at that period, I think, we see, we saw waves of changes in housing, you know, from mass council housing building to the explosion, what we have now, of private rented accommodation. And it wasn't just that. We also, alongside that, we saw the growing influence of builders, developers, and, you know, legislation that actively and consciously push people into um, poverty. You know, and the figures today are horrendous. Uh, I think this is from Shelter. In England alone, 125,000 children sleep in temporary accommodation. There's almost 100,000 households in England in temporary accommodation. And, you know, temporary accommodation was never supposed to be about housing. It was an emergency stopgap. Now families are living for years in temporary accommodation, um, even though their priority... Three minutes left? Oh, my God. Lady <laughs> <laughs> me, right? Oh, shut up. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, it, that's fine. No, it's my fault. Uh, so, obviously, we are all witnesses to the consequences of exploding inequality in housing. There is a growing housing movement. It's brilliant to see so many campaigners coming together, particularly uh, private renters. You know, the past couple of years, there's loads of groups. In July, uh, under the umbrella of uh, Housing Rebellion, there's going to be loads of 
housing campaigns uh, being part, you know, being part of a day of action is going to be against sort of demolition. And, you know, we know that um, all these houses, hundreds of thousands that have been sold off or demolished, they could have been retrofitted, they could have been renovated, so it's about demolition, it's about issues over empty homes, so there's a quarter of a million empty homes in this country, there's another quarter of a million with no certain tenant, and it's about a fight for, you know, other groups are fighting for the protection of green spaces and much more. So, we want, obviously, we want, we don't just want to be fighting back against these attacks. We want to build, you know, a movement for a different type of housing that addresses climate change, rising housing costs, and looking at the needs of the community. You know, you can go back to the passive housing movement of the 1970s, you know, that kind of housing offers a path towards uh, achieving zero energy buildings. I'll just finish by saying that um, obviously the working class has the power to bring about fundamental change. And I think we need to recreate that fear that we created in 2017, where when we've got a glimpse of workers' power, and this time we need to make sure we win. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, our next speaker. Um, is El oh, okay. yeah, is El Elizabeth Salmon. Elizabeth is a recently joined member of the Socialist Workers Party. She's a housing solicitor and she's a yeah, not sure, uh, member of uh, the Renters Union, but I'm sure Elizabeth will explain a bit more about Renters Union. Right on. Okay, so um, I'm a member of the London Renters Union. Um, we've done recent actions and we've been a part of the coalition, the Home for All coalition. Um, so my part of the talk is gonna focus primarily on rent controls and suitability. Um, and a little bit of my own experiences of working in housing law for like the past decade and um, being qualified for the past six. So I don't think I need to explain to all of you here that rents and the ever increasing pursuit of profits is a social ill that we are experiencing right now. And some of the effects that it has is the displacement of communities by ever increasing rents, poor and marginalized communities. It's a very clear way of saying that we don't want you in the area when they increase your rent. Um, <clears throat> impoverishes working people. It further subsidizes the rich um, through housing benefit. That money's going straight back into the pockets of the already wealthy. Um, and it's at the same time, housing benefit has this odd effect where you have a benefit cap that puts limits on the poor on where they can live because the rents are increasing. So we've got this benefit cap on one side for us, but ever increasing profit for them. Um, it has a knock on effect on all of us being poorer. And there's a greater burden on local authorities. More, I've already told you about temporary accommodation. But temporary accommodation is provided by private companies that have leased their properties to the council for many years at eye-watering prices yeah. because PFI. So you're going back to the same private rented sector that caused that person to be homeless to rehouse them. It's a mess. It's not a housing market. It's a housing mess. Um, and because of all of this, the process of evicting someone and causing that upheaval via their increasing their rent is big business in short. So um, in terms of rent control, rent control was, I think recently people are beginning to talk about it, especially since the winds in Scotland. Um, but the prevailing idea was this quote, um, the fastest way to destroy a city other than bombing is providing rent controls. That was said by a Nobel Prize economics um, person called Azar Limbeck. I don't know who he is, but um, <laughs> it's, a dumb, <laughs> it's a dumb idea because the argument runs in this way. So some, some think the landlords will leave the market. Oh, won't someone think of the landlord? Smallest violin. Um, 
and that basically it will cause the smaller exploitative landlords, the Rackmans, the McGowans, the etc., to leave the market and replace them with larger, more exploitative landlords, the Black Rocks, right? So that's one argument that um, in enforcing rent controls will cause to the market. The second idea is that sc scarce resources don't become less scarce because you've put a cap on rent. Um, and that crafty bastard landlords will find another way to be crafty bastards. Um, they'll think of ways to price gouge or discriminate, um, such as not providing carpets in properties or making you pay for appliances. This is another way that they can get money without actually breaching any laws. The carpet one is a thing that housing associations still actually do. It really annoys me. Um, we have to remember when we're faced with these arguments that we had rent at tenancies, we had rent control, it worked um, before the disastrous Housing Act of 1988 and um, assured shorthold tenancies in Section 21 were introduced. So this idea that seems so radical before the pandemic is now becoming accepted wisdom. Um, a recent Ipsos Mori poll said that at least two thirds of Britons are in support of some form of rent control. So you know, take heart from that. Um, so right now, where we are at the moment, the London Renters Union, we're campaigned, we've campaigned for a rent freeze. We campaigned back in December for a rent freeze during the cost of living crisis, because it's, it's essential that people are able to afford the homes that they live in, that they're not displaced, that they're able to stay where they need to be around their community. Um, and we will be campaigning against rent hike evictions. The recent rent reforms bill, that's gone, that's going through Parliament to end Section 21. It's also, we're worried that it doesn't have any provisions for people who may, for crafty bastard landlords who will actually um, increase rents and um, get people out in that manner. Um, Living Rent Scotland secured their rent cap of no increases of more than 3% during the pandemic and that's due to be reviewed in September of this year so we're going to be keeping a watch on that. Catalonia got a new law which will set maximum rental prices that can be charged for a, any apartment or home and it applies to the area of Catalonia where the market is defined as being under stress for example where rent prices exceed 30 percent of average household incomes that means that basically the rent can't exceed 30 percent of a person's income what I want to say in this regard is that basically we have different forms of rent caps, rent controls, rent freezes. It's very adaptable. We don't need to get bogged down in the small detail. We know that our rent should be lower. Um, even in America, rent control regulations exist in five states, as well as Washington, D.C., New York, New Jersey, California, Oregon and Maryland. And there's always campaigns going on to increase that. Um, so basically, one of the other parts to this, the flip side of rent controls, is that once we have the rent controls, obviously housing is still scarce. So what we need is good, as in better than decent, affordable and suitable homes. And I'm going to get onto that part of suitability in a bit. So how we win rent controls. We keep up the freeze, we make it very frosty and we make it very unhospitable for landlords to want to rent out homes in this market. We push the government not only to build, but to tax empty homes. They need to introduce land tax, which is a whole other conversation on its own, but taxing empty homes, increasing the council tax on empty homes, getting compulsory purchase orders of empty properties and undeveloped lots so that they can build. Put inputting interim and final management orders for properties under licensing scheme. That means that any property that's been let out that doesn't meet the licensing requirements for that area, the council can take it back and manage it. And they charge the landlord for the cost. They don't use them nearly enough. It's right there in the law. Um, and then we push for rent cuts. After we freeze, then we cut. Okay, we keep going until we get a world where charging to use land is preposterous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frankly, we're going straightly, but that's the radical vision, yeah. abolition of rent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so here I just wanted to talk really briefly about suitability. Um, oh, yep, okay, that's all right, and as well. Okay, so suitability a large amount of med cases are suitability cases. People coming to see us about, I can't, I can't manage the stairs anymore in my home. I can't, you know, I can't get to my, the local tube. I can't get to the bus stop. Um, and I don't know about you conference, but I am in my mid thirties and my knees click in disagreement if I get up too fast. Um, <laughs> we are all pre-disabled and i really need people to walk away with that idea start thinking about the ways in which yeah the ways in which we may have our circumstances change how we may have to really reconsider our homes will it be adaptable if something happens to us if we cannot walk around if we're not as mobile as we used to be and I, I wish no calamity on anyone touch wood that we all stay okay but you know we need homes that adapt as we age and as our circumstances change and we don't have that um the equality and human rights commission research 2022 shows that 93 percent of uk rentals are inaccessible to disabled there's that's because there's too many steps the entrances are too small they can't reach for things are in and around their home it attracts people in their home. People were trapped in Grenfell. Not just that, I'm sure there were probably disabled people on the 10th, 11th, 12th floor placed there by councils. And I feel that there's a real lack of imagination as to how we live, okay? Um, we want to live atomized or communal. We need to think about whether we want to live individually, communally, how our properties will be adapted. Will we be able to bring cabinets down at a whim? I really, if there's any architects in the room, people interested in planning, this is your call, okay? Um, because it's time that we started thinking about that and how we work our infrastructure into working around our homes and how we get there. Um, so in summation, I probably don't have that. In summation, um, fuck rent, basically. <laughs> yeah. And also let's get the homes that we need and that suit our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, our final speaker, is Eileen Short. Eileen is a leading Defend Council housing activist and a long-standing member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Team. <laughs> this team. Um, I want to start by saying the obvious. Housing right now is impoverishing most people that there are about well depending whose figures you believe there's about 10 million people already in britain whose housing is not suitable for them that's heading for one in seven people it's either too expensive too overcrowded inaccessible as elizabeth was saying or in other ways not right um there are over 3 million people who can't afford the home they're in, and there's huge numbers of people who are living in relation, family or relationship setups that they don't choose. Now, all of this is not, A, it's not inevitable. And I say that as somebody who was alive in 1980, when one in three people in Britain had a council tenancy and the private rented sector was so big. So I'm not just talking theory here. We actually know this can be different. That's one side of it. And we can take confidence and be inspired. The other side of it is they did this on purpose because this is the housing market. This is what they want. This is what they do. They drive us to the bottom in order to extract maximum wealth 
from us at every angle. It's not just in Sainsbury's and in your gas bill, it's also in your housing arrangements. And that is how, that is the housing market. Um, and numbers of the things that we have won in the past have been swept away, as Elizabeth was saying, you know, the wear rent controls. When the Tories abolished it, they said, let housing benefit take the strain of meeting the bills and now they cap housing benefit and hang people out to dry um and on the other hand since 2013 30 billion pounds of our collective public money has been spent to subsidize so-called help to buy which is a, a racket of its own kind, which mostly subsidizes big developers and, you know, catches anybody who's lucky enough to get in on the tails of it in lifelong debt. Um, and the estimate figure, which may be a little bit out of date, is for every pound that is currently spent on building and developing council or housing association housing, 15 pounds goes in subsidies to private landlords and the private housing market in one way or another. So I'm just trying to paint a picture of this is not, oh, you know, nobody knows how to solve the housing problem. This is, this is, they did it on purpose and we have to start from there because well-meaningness isn't going to get us out of this um and when you know not all the national residential landlords associations sometimes say they support things that tenants are demanding but that's all fine but we have to know that the way we change this is to build the kind of movement that elizabeth and morag have been talking about and we know we can do it because we've done it before and as Morag was saying the bit Morag didn't put in about 1914 was the women of Glasgow who while war and destitution was going on and landlords of course in response were jacking up the rents uh, the women of Glasgow said on your bike <laughs> we're not paying it um, a massive rent strike which involved tactics when the when the bailiffs were being sent in the women would go out and bang the pots and the workers off the railways and the docks would walk out and see off the the bailiffs now sure. that is an example we're not quite there where we can organize that right now but that is the class as a whole fighting to defend itself and that's the model of how we build a movement um and in 1945 Again, with the threat of revolution snapping at their heels, um, the, there were mass squatting and occupying movements in Britain because the homes had been bombed and they weren't being replaced and nobody had fit homes to live in. Um, and former army bases were occupied and then other big uh, settlements were occupied and this was the motor that meant Harlow Newtown was built and various other massive council housing development was built to I have to say high standards not necessarily informed by everything we know today but those are the houses that are still standing on like some of the later stuff um but the rent strikes in the 1960s didn't defeat the Housing Finance Act, but they surely put the whole tenants movement on a stronger and higher and more combative footing. I like to think as a little footnote in this history, the work that Defend Council Housing did to see off, not all, but we think about one in three of the, the large scale privatisation threats against council housing. It was defeated it was defeated in birmingham it was defeated in large parts of london and that was partly because we organized as tenants linked with trade unionists who were at the forefront of threats to jobs and all the rest of it and supported by the councillors and mps who agreed with us that was always our principle 
we'll work with you if you agree with us that you want to stop privatization and win direct investment and there's numbers of people in this room who've been part of those battles and are here today because we know that we know how to win um but even more recently in 2015 it's a bit of an unsung bit of history the housing and planning bill which attempted to introduce uh, means tested rents for council tenants that you'd pay more if you if you earned more uh, that you'd they'd force through numbers of other changes and by building a campaign that united about 120 different tenant and housing groups and organizations we saw off whole chunks of the housing and planning bill we marched through London without anybody's permission <laughs> we, we did whatever we wanted and homes for all grew out of that campaign so this isn't just old stuff we're talking this we have the capacity to do this once we get on the front foot rather than the back but i think when we're thinking how do we build that movement we need united strategy like elizabeth talked about the um the call for the rent freeze during covid and one of the things that I feel was another real achievement was the way in which we, by all the organizations reaching outwards, we got a whole coalition is not quite the word, but a, a get about 50, 60 organizations to collectively sign up to demand the rent freeze. And that gave us clout, which really helped. Many of those same organizations signed up to support the shelter workers when they were taking strike action. And when we sent that letter, the board of shelter suddenly went, OK, we're settling the strike. Now, that's anecdotal, mm -hmm. but I think what it shows is when we pull together, build, build our unity and work as a class rather than as supplicants, then we know how to win. Um, but I think this is final thing I want to say. This is where the politics comes in. And I know people sometimes want to talk about fighting for how on housing is not political. It's intensely political. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as an example, you're building a united movement, but united how? We always say there's a hundred different ways in which we can be divided and played off against each other. There's the obvious ways tenants versus leaseholders versus private renters on an estate. Can you? build unity or are we all being played off with our vested interests i'm not going to you'll be relieved to know <laughs> talk about it in great detail but it's a it requires politics to work out how to do it is housing a generational problem did people like me go off with all the housing and leave the next generation without any that isn't the way that we're going to win this fight. It is true that if you sorted your tenancy or your or bought a house 30 years ago, you're probably all right. And if you're later than that, sorry, but there ain't none. Um, but we have to fight as a class and we have to not get played off intergenerationally. More importantly, well, it's all important. Um, are migrants taking all the houses? I'm not going to go into this argument now, but obviously that isn't the truth. But this is why we produce leaflets like this. And my shh, the one thing I would say is if you have a housing campaign of any sort, be it by people in your block or a national organization, it has to be an anti racist housing campaign because otherwise. <laughs> Yes, yes, otherwise. But there's other questions. The 15 minute city, I'm sure I'm, you'll be relieved again. I'm not going to go into this. But fascists and uber right wingers on social media are beginning to organize around this question of the 15 minute city as a conspiracy um, to do what? Who knows? um to drive nice people out of cities i I'm, you know and to drive them out of their cars anyway i won't but it is another question where we as housing campaigners need to get on it name it and say no we want cities for human beings who can breathe the air 
and walk if they want to and kids can play in the street mm -hmm. and we know because in Norwich they built some beautiful council housing to passive house standards not very long ago built around playing spaces we know this can be done and we have to build the movement that can win it so you get my point <laughs> but uh, the final thing I want to say is that when we look at our history, and it's a proud history, and I am really proud to stand in the tradition of revolutionary socialists fighting for housing. And in my opinion, it's not say, we're not saying, oh, well, dears, you're worried about your rent, but really the point is to overthrow capitalism. That's not how this goes. <laughs> we overthrow the rent in the process, building the movement that can challenge capitalism at its fundamental and rotten roots. And so if you read, Engels on the housing question. I mean, you could get depressed, you know, because in, in 1872, he was saying, in reality, the bourgeoisie has only one method of solving the housing question after its fashion. That is to say, of solving it in such a way that the solution continually reproduces the question anew. Mm -hmm. He then elaborates exactly how they do that in 1872. But I think the point really is that we identify, build a movement that can win rent controls, that can successfully carry out and support squatting and repossession of empty housing and un, you know, underused housing. And at the same time, admit to ourselves and each other and the world that we are sick to death of having to spend all our time fighting to have a roof over their head and suitable housing. Yeah. And actually we have to change the system so that that becomes a thing we can absolutely take for granted and get on with doing the other stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, now we're going to do the I'm mindful of time. Um, two minutes, just chatting to the person next to you about what you've heard, and then we'll op I'll come back to opening the meeting to questions and contributions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. Um, I bet that was people still had a lot, a lot to discuss. So, um, can I open? the meeting now to any questions oh <laughs> whoops okay i'm going to try and do this as fairly as possible but i can see from the array of hands that i'm going to have to ask you to keep your contribution to two minutes we've got iceland um, here oh there's two of us from iceland <laughs> okay um okay uh <laughs> um, I'm going to take if you could just if I could take your hands in two or three so that I can call you and then I'll don't don't keep if you haven't been called put your hand up so if we can start from the Iceland folk <laughs> um, and then um, I'll take Sorry. person there with glasses and then um, person here in the front okay so if we just start that way. Thank you. I'm gonna to have to be quite strict to time, so go. It's right. Um, yeah. Yes. I was waiting for a mic, sorry. Um, yeah, like, like she said, I was, I'm from Iceland. Uh, I've also lived uh, in London. Uh, I was a council tenant in London in 1996. Um, and then moved back to Iceland and now I'm a council tenant in Reykjavik. Um, and um, I mean, in Reykjavik, I mean, Reykjavik has the highest concentration of social housing in Iceland, and it's 5% in Reykjavik, social housing, social housing. Um, we, uh, I mean, we come from the Socialist Party in Iceland. We founded the party six years ago. We have, now we have two city councillors, um, and I was on the board of social housing on their behalf uh, for four years. Uh, which was a bit of a waste of time. It was, um, you know, basically about damage control. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm also working with the Tenants Association in Iceland. I would like to speak to you afterwards. <laughs> and uh, I mean, 
we are just dealing with the, the same problems. I mean, everything you said today, we are experiencing. They are, I mean, the, the, there are like housing companies, private housing companies, they are totally taking over the housing market. They are raising rents like increasingly. And then One I minute. Take much time, but um, yeah, thank you. I would like to speak with you. <laughs> And thanks, they're really good introductions. I just want to kind of reinforce the way in which the housing divide is deliberately being used to strengthen and to intensify class divisions. Because if you remember the 2008 crash, when literally billions uh, of, of our money through quantitative easing was poured in to tear out the banks on the idea that the banks would then invest in productive industries that would give people jobs, raise wages, et cetera. And uh, the reality um, was that the banks invested money in property or the financial institutions invested money in either buying back stock uh, to raise dividends for shareholders to make the already wealthy even wealthier. Uh, and they invested in property to raise the value of property to make the rich even richer. And so particularly since 2008, we've seen this massive divide growing where you now have empty houses all over London, empty blocks, line empty, because property earns more than people. And if that isn't a summation of the rottenness of the capitalist system, mm. I don't know what is. And I think it shows that it's systemic, but it's also fragile, because at the moment, with interest rates having undergone a massive hike, it's not only renters are going to be screwed, it's all the people that have been tied in mortgages beyond which they can afford you now face impoverishment so i think we're at a time when the crisis is coming to a head the tories are weak renters mortgage owners all working class people all together we've now got to give them a push because without system change all the reforms that you talked about that are possible completely possible we saw in covid homeless people could be taken off the streets it's yeah. possible but not without system change and that is going to require all of us together saying that housing is absolutely a political issue. It's about class, and we've got to smash this rotten class system. Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully timed. So, um, if we're on two minutes, over to you. I'll give tap the mic when you at one minute. Just I'll do that for everyone. Thank you. Lovely. Um, I uh, am speaking as a architect student and I get involved in some um, housing campaigns as well. And I'll start with um, something I've written very recently about this crisis um, in an article that is to, capit to capitulate to the notion that there is no alternative to free market fundamentalism is to be an opposition of history and its prolific examples of community defiance to demolition, derogation and dictatorship of capital. Alternatives to neoliberal city exist, either, even under its omnipresent influence, because human behavior is so profoundly at variance with it. And um, beyond this, um, uh, I think that part of, the, part of the narrative that we need to build more homes is, of course, true, but this uh, argument is also used in propaganda for awful de private development who. Um, see uh, densification as a way to build more houses, to make more profit, and also to justify the violence of demolition to destroy working class um, communities and social housing also, and also the environmental destruction from demolition. So I think we should be wary of the uh, propaganda that goes into the more homes argument and actually take it in a revolutionary stance. And I think as well- Minute, comrade. Um, the argument that um, we need more homes, there's alternative narratives. There's a architect called Peter Barber, who exclusively builds social housing, so one of the better ones. And he has a concept called the 8,000 8, 8, mile city, that's the coast around the United Kingdom. And the fact that we need to, um, instead of having this emphasis on London and the vicinity to Canary Wharf, um, we need to um, revitalize communities around the coast, around the United Kingdom, and um, to revitalize the entirety of the United Kingdom, not just London. And I think that the top down enforced um, idea of housing, there are um, other narratives or other alternatives, architects like Gian Carlo de Carlo, 
and Volti Singal. And I think that we should call out um, de demolition and gentrification in all instances as racist, as social cleansing, and that uh, um, housing is a human right. Thank you. When, when I was uh, young, when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have all these people sleeping on the streets and people begging. You know, it was rare to see somebody who was homeless. And so we have regressed. You know, when I was 17, I was able to, I, I could have left home and, and, and lived in a bedsit instead I went overseas. But, you know, it was possible. Now we have people who can't leave home at thir in their 30s yeah. because there's nowhere to live, even as a renter. What we talk about is home ownership. And the elderly, you know, they, they've designed, they're supposed, you know, they have these sheltered housing schemes. I now live in one. There's nothing about the design in those sheltered housing schemes that is designed for the people who live in them. Mm -hmm. As you get older, you get shorter. And they're, they're not ergonomically designed for the people who live in them. The only good thing is that there, there is there's organizations that are focusing on designing for what's called the silver sector. And I need to nudge them in the direction of <clears throat> away from just building apps because a lot of elderly people think apps are something that swings through a tree and eats bananas, but <laughs> <laughs> towards designing the basics, the, mm. the real solid basics that we need because people who um, are living in unsuitable homes they're causing the bed blocking. They can't be, be discharged from hospital. That's what's causing our bed blocking problem. And people who are in those homes right now and who can't cope properly, they're going into care homes and that costs an awful lot of money. And that's another big social problem. So that's, you know, we have to be actually physically designing the basics for a huge community of growing elderly so that they're not a burden on the younger generation. Thank you. Thank you. So it's you and then person at the back. Yes, man sitting on the stairs. Yeah. So Go I on. just kind of want to. Do you understand? Because of sound. Sorry. So I just kind of want to bring up the point of being a student. So I moved to London in this September and I started uni. Um, on campus, accommodation prices are not too bad, they're manageable. But then once you move off of campus, because they force you to, you can't live more than one year on campus, uh, you start looking at prices for a one bedroom apartment or a one room with a shared bathroom. Prices like a thousand three hundred pounds a month, which is just like, what? Um, so it's insane. And I know that the solution that we all want is to abolish private property and to have a revolution, all that stuff. But in the short term, how can students find housing that's accessible, I guess, in many ways? So that would be my question to you. Thank you so much. OK, a uh, person up there. And I'm going to go to the other side of the room. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to do my best to be fair. Um, and then the person there. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the, talk about the planning system. Uh, in London, we had the London Plan 1944. So they talked about what was going to happen after the Second World War. How many people were going to live in London? What their needs were going to be? How many houses needed to be built? What kind of houses? How much green space? And so, and so on. There's always been a struggle around this, but increasingly we've had a planning system of, you know, dominated by the interests of property developers. So you're in the London Plan now, and you see that there's no... There's very little need for family-sized housing. You read arguments that affluent, younger affluent <laughs> Londoners don't have children. They don't need a living room. Why don't they? <laughs> Why? Because they're too busy on time. They're too busy with their job to have to have, to, 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 have, to have children. We had a huge argument about that. It was absolutely took the Mickey out of it. We made them laugh at it, and they changed the policy ever so slightly. The other thing for which we've had is planning to smash up communities under the name of improvement, mm. under the name of gentrification, as the previous speaker said. In Harringay, where I live, 
We had a, a scheme like that where we smashed it up and we defeated it. Yeah. This was done by working inside the Labour Party and outside in the community and having a coalition of people who didn't agree about anything else except that we thought this was a bad idea, this was wrong, we proved it was wrong in terms of evidence, and now it got kicked out and it didn't, didn't happen anymore. Thank you. Um, question over here, and then um, I'll go across, sorry, to the woman in front here. So this person here first. Yeah. You know what? I, there's something, <laughs> I, something that one issue that gets my goat is about housing. And I maybe come from it a different angle. I'm an ex street person, three years on the streets, number three years in the hostels. I see, I carry with me scars both mentally and physically from the streets. I know the people from the streets, the amount of ex soldiers that are dumped there and they don't give a damn about, the amount of people who went right through the care system. I can't count the amount of people I know that were sexually abused in the care system. <laughs> it wasn't no migrant that made me homeless. It wasn't no refugee that made me homeless. It wasn't no asylum seeker who made me homeless. I know the way the state treats us. I was one of those people you see on the corner of the street begging or selling the biggest <coughs> If I ask you one thing, you don't have to give us a change. Why don't we have a chat with us one time? Kind word. We do more good than anything sometimes. I've been, the only reason I was housed is because I ended up in a hospital because we ended up with a lot of health problems. And a consultant, when I went to an a and &E, an a and &E that had a policy a policy of not admitting the homeless. A policy, it was there. I had a consultant stand there and argue with the sister who was saying, we're not admitting. He says, well, he's only getting a getting an ambulance to another main hospital. We have a policy, we're not admitting him. I know of two cases <clears throat> where people had died. Yeah, so, what's your time, comrade? Wow. Just one. Yeah. And I'll finish in this. I came to the Socialist Workers' Party through anger. I was angry. I wanted answers. I wanted answers. And I'll tell you what, it was the Socialist Workers' Party that gave me answers that says, I can do something. I can do something. I can fight for a better world. I can do something, I can get out there, I can make my voice heard. So if you're not in the party, it's time you join and make this a better world. <laughs> okay, um, the person in, woman in front there, yeah. And I'm trying desperately to zip across the room. Um, there was a person behind you with yeah, go with glasses. Your hand's not up anymore. No, it's you, you still want to say something. Yes. So the person in the front, person with glasses, and then the person behind. Yes. Go on. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm from Iceland also. And oh. I'm, I'm uh, actually uh, uh, leading a housing group for the uh, Association of the Disabled in Iceland, and uh, we have been fighting for also because it, it's kind of uh, what Iceland is doing is young people that are disabled and they're not getting like uh, service from from the health uh, or from the like um, from the government to live at home. They're put in, in uh, nursing homes for the elderly. So maybe young people, all, all, you know, 75 year olds, <clears throat> disabled, put in 
And elderly home where the average age is maybe 93. So this is horrible. And we have been like, uh, yeah, and people have, we have been like uh, taking uh, case to court because of this. And, and we won that case. And then uh, now the, the elderly house or like the elderly home is now uh, trying to get money from that man who won that case. <coughs> Because he didn't want to pay for being there. So they're trying to get his own house. He had the house actually. So this is crazy things going on. But what we have done, we have uh, managed to uh, make uh, make this make us hurt by uh, protesting and, and having like uh, speaks about it and, and stuff like that. So now the health department has made a, a Group to find the solution of this, so that we we can have a have a voice and change things. I just wanted to, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so the person behind, first behind, and then our last speaker will be the young person here in the front. I'm sorry for all the people I couldn't take, but please stay, and we'll continue the discussion. Um, go on, yes. Uh, Close as possible, please. All right. I mean, I think before the meeting, I didn't know what to speak up a bit, please. Speak up because they can't hear you. Yeah, or stand. Uh, before the meeting, I didn't exactly know of any goddamn solution to like the housing crisis coming up. It's just really one of the most hopeless situations out there. Like, what's the first step can we even take? And then one of the speakers mentioned about like taxing empty homes, make the homes be unable to be sold so that like the landlord can make profit out of it. And the landlord should be charged for homes, which is like written all also along with like rent freeze. And as we all know, migrants don't exactly cost like the housing prices, it's the landlords. It's like, how are the migrants gonna cost the housing prices if they don't even have houses or money to work with? It's uh, ridiculous if you ask me, but like, it's just, I don't know much about it. And I was like wondering, how can we implement these solutions? And how can we like, are there any more things we can do to like combat like the fucking whole government? Because they're the ones being, having more power. And it seems pretty hopeless to stand up against the government. Like, it, it, I don't know what to do. Like the inflation rates, everything's rising up. And it's like the, the bastardization of housing, which is like a human need by, real estate right is there like any way to abolish real estate once and for all and like maybe one day when we're all free we can like kill the team the landlords <laughs> <laughs> yeah one was that more started with Grenfell right and in some ways this sums up uh, the society's attitude towards housing and working class people because they can kill you they, and then they can walk away, take no notice of the safety changes that need to be made and let the people walk out the door stop free. Mm -hmm. right? so, and this is a story about when you quote with Engels about you know, the, the, the condition of English working class, right, stuff in our entire history, stuff in internationally, it's been we have to fight for the most basic idea of putting a roof over your head that is manageable and your family can live in, right, stuff around. This is our scene, really, the society is, and Grenfell stands still there as a statement for that. But I want to talk quickly about a collective, because when the comrade spoke about students, what do you do, right, so there's, a, there's something that students could do. If on the university campuses, student unions were organising to hold down rent, to demand that it's not just one year, it's the second year, that proper power is provided and the rest of it, the collective solution, we could do something, right, stuff around it. When you talk about the mass strikes that are going on at the minute in Britain, or what's going on in France and the rest of it, one of the things we've got to argue for trade unions and everything else, we have to put these things back on the agenda, yeah. right? The idea of council housing, people have to back council housing like it was this evil thing yeah. or terrible blocks. It was a place where you got a decent house for a decent rent, right? Stuff that it wasn't about trying to spend 80, you know, 50 percent or 60 percent of your income on it, right? Stuff, and you will be treated with decency and live in a community, right? Stuff about, and this is the thing we've got to get back on the agenda. And the last thing that is, if you look at 
you know, the workers' housing that was built in Vienna and stuff in the 30s, and other places and stuff. When, when workers, when the housing question is tackled, is when working class people are fighting back collectively. Mm -hmm. That's what it is in the mid, in the short. So the answer to this isn't just wait for the revolution. You've got to get organized. You got to join the renters' unions. You've got to get involved with different kinds of housing. You've got to get involved with homes for all and the rest of it. But we've got to put an argument back into our movement, right? That it is not some peripheral issue, right? It's the most basic of human rights. And alongside the strikes, demanding more pay and the rest of it, we have to start putting on the agenda. We all deserve a decent bloody home. We all deserve a way and we have to go back one thing, go back to the 80s, man. Let's have a situation where most people are not scrubbing to live in private rented accommodation, which is horrible, you can't afford, you've got no choice in the rest. We've got to put this argument back on the agenda. It means taking it back into collective organizations and putting it out the top of the agenda. Thank you. And our last go on. Hello, I I come from from Spain. So the the problem there in Spain with the mortgage. Some people have the mortgage for thirty years, and they have signed a contract with the bank. And when in two thousand and eight they start the the crisis, uh, people lost their job, and people um, couldn't afford the pay the mortgage. So I don't know if it works like in England, like Spain. So but people were kids out of the houses. Um, and they carry on paying the mortgage because already signed with the banks. So out of the house, paying a rent and paying the mortgage that is paying for the banks only, not for living. So the only solution is we need to not become the house in a business. So we need another economy, we need a plan, the economy for the houses because the government has to intervene the banks have to regulate the price, the price of the bonds. You need to calculate the the cost of production of the houses, and, may, and because someone putting at the prices is becoming rich in cost of the of the poor people of the society. So mm, the government had to put one solution is to put a limits of the price of, in the of the bankers. Other solution is to become the housing public. But uh, they need to put a limit in the in the prices, and of course in Spain, in the case of Spain, so once if you cannot afford to pay the the house and you sign a mortgage, so you you don't need to carry on uh, paying to the banks because this is very abused in in Spain. I don't know it in England works uh, like Spain, but it is really abused there in there in Spain. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring back our speakers now. Um, starting with Moreg. Mm. Um, sorry, I've got a couple announcements. Forgot that there were so many, so many um, <coughs> speakers. What a brilliant discussion, everyone! Um, and hopefully, people can stay and we can continue the discussion. A um, couple of the uh, announcements, sorry, let me just find them. Um, firstly, your last chance to visit Bookmarks Bookshop and browse the best selection of radical books in Britain. It's here in Senate House, if you haven't seen it. And I would also recommend Peter Apps's book. He's won the Orwell Prize for this book called Show Me the Bodies, How We Let Grandfall Happen. Um, that's at Bookmarks. Um, also, to remind you about the rally this evening, the closing rally, um, which will be joined by Richard Boyd Barrett, who's a socialist MP in the Irish Parliament, will be joined by Jechi, who's uh, Tanu, who's a Ghanaian socialist, and Amy Leather, who's the Joint National Secretary of the Socialist Workers' Party, and French socialists who will be speaking on the rights and resistance taking place. So that's 5.30 in Friends Meeting House, which is five minutes from SOAS. And then we will be in the Institute Bar again afterwards. And um, final announcement is that there's a Workers' Summit happening on the 23rd of September in London, which is a grassroots event debating how we can overcome the obstacles and fight for strikes to win. So um, please take sign up and uh, take leaflets, which will be around at Marxism Festival today. Thank you, Morag. Sorry. Thanks.
be the wee clip that I see on you a minute to go. I just, I'll just say a couple of things, just to the comrade asking about students. I'd really urge you to get in touch with um, students at Manchester University. You know, they've had a number of rent strikes. They've gone into occupation. So it'd be really good to see students around the country sort of linking together and, you know, fighting for a genuinely affordable rent on site, but also fighting for, um, you know, accommodation in the area where you live. I mean, like I said earlier, I think we are, we have been battered over the past couple of years by the, the Tories. Uh, every aspect of our lives, we've just been, you know, fighting back against it. And one of the things, I think all of us, Homes for Old, Fine Council Housing, um, we are pushing more now to really link up with the trade union movement. Um, so we are going to be calling on the trade union movement to support a five point plan for council housing. Um, because we need to start going on the offensive. Every aspect of housing is broken. And it, you know, it's not just, as I was saying earlier, it's not just about housing. Um, the anchors, nearly three million, from last year have had to use the food bank at some point in this country, three million. Wow. I mean, it's appalling. I'd never, last year, I'd never heard of um, warm banks, but because of the cost of living crisis last year, the fact that people couldn't afford to live in their own homes, <laughs> local authorities start setting up these warm places for the elderly and the children to go and sit in the community set or in the library. You know, it's it's absolutely appalling. And I think I'm obviously inspired by the strikes. You know, the trade union movement, rank and file workers are slowly beginning to, to build their confidence. And just to finish with the um, inspirational strike by the St. Mungo workers. These are housing workers. Um, wages and it's not them that's just affected by housing it's the client group that we work where people you know were really complex support needs who are stuck in uh, hostels they either move backwards they move forwards there's no pathway into any suitable housing for them or even the workers so you know as i say it's a really inspirational strike it's political and, you know, I'd urge people to go down there. And if you didn't have a housing group where you live, I'd urge you to get in contact with Homes for All, Renters Union, uh, Defend Council Housing. We have monthly uh, Zoom meetings and we start building up, linking this up with the trade union movement and build a real fight back. So a couple of points. Um, oh, I can project from here. Um, no, okay, it's quite tough for the people on that side. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so basically, I uh, wanted to say a quick word about um, street homelessness. Thank you so much for sharing the story. Um, there's this. There's this odd division that we seem to have um, that street homelessness is somehow separate from the issues of housing overall, but if we're going to build a future and a community that serves all, it has to truly serve all. Um, it occurs to me as well that homelessness in and of itself is a big business. Um, the provision of, yeah, the provision of um, every, every winter, we go through this rigmarole, I end up going to a homelessness forum in the local borough where I work and we all sit around and we all say, oh, isn't that sad? Oh, isn't that difficult? How are we going to keep everyone inside for winter and then chuck them back out again? And it's really frustrating because we end up with this. We know that we can do it. Like you, like you said, the lady that was sitting over there, she's gone now. Um, we know that we can do it. We know that we can house absolutely everyone who's on the street right now. We did it over COVID. COVID proved a lot of things to us. Um, and it's just unacceptable that we continue to do that and which is why I say even though we've been talking about council housing the end goal should be public housing housing that is for us owned by us yeah that's so let me clarify when we say that we want 
housing that in the future that we don't have to pay rent that's because we all own it we all have a collective stake in it um uh i'm very aware of the just build more homes issue being one that's kind of uh basically a, a tool of investment companies to to say oh we want more homes yeah of course you want more homes but we want more homes for our rich friends and that's what we have to reject um i think in terms of building homes the homes that we want short term right now are affordable better than decent accessible to all and that's why we focused i think mainly on council housing because that's the housing that we've had that does that and it does it now um and i think that also in terms of acting now it's joining a union joining london renters union um if you want to join please talk to me afterwards um we are going to be campaigning for getting rid of these ridiculously high rents stopping rent height evictions um in terms of student accommodation and student accommodation after that's been done it's it's one of those weird things because they get council tax rebates for housing you yeah they don't have to pay council tax did you know that yeah so this is something that you know this is a public of course it's a public good to house you near where you're going to study so we need to start looking at ways that we can mess that up like say to them you know you get money saved from me being in this property it's time you started treating us well yeah so start organizing start talking to some of us um and we can always brainstorm around lunch okay um yeah and i think that's my main bits really oh and the spanish mortgage crisis thing is really important because it brought together mortgage um people who owned houses and people who were renting mm -hmm. and before they thought oh we're so different you know i i've got mine i've got my house um in that kind of way but i think it was really important that those two groups came together and built the housing movement in um spain i thought that was really interesting to hear thank you elizabeth and our final speaker eileen short So oh, yeah, first I have to say, council housing is public housing. That's what it's built. It's collectively publicly owned with a landlord you can hold to account. Now, is it perfect? It is not. Um, and of course, the more the market penetrates the whole construction and repair and whatever sector, the more they seep away at the things we've won. But the reason my rent used to be less than 60 quid was because the rent that we paid was only the cost of the borrowing to build it and the repairs and maintenance. Council housing paid for itself. It was a, not only was it better for us, but it, we had secure tenancies. We had a right to space standards and light standards. And why did we have all those things? Every one of them was a pitch battle <laughs> to win those lights. So let's not this isn't a passive process. The, the danger of the kicking we've all taken is that the stigmatization and the sense that this one, that one, street sleepers or whatever are all right off groups and council tenants are sort of like beyond the pale. That isn't the way this is all working class people scrabbling around trying to live. And I think in Spain, yes, the, the, the mortgage crisis created a radical movement which knocked straight through into Spanish politics. And I think that's our model. In building a movement, we work out demand so that mortgage payers need to be able to have the right to stay and pay rent instead. For example, we've got a mortgage crisis coming in this country and we need to work out how to pitch those demands and build that movement. Similarly with the students, I don't need to go over it except to add, I can think of at least four estates and blocks in London that are threatened with demolition and therefore people are being moved out. And if as part of building a movement, some of our comrades oh, thought they should be occupied, well, there you go. Yeah. 
but it, you know, but we have to do it as a class. We have to have the forces to protect and defend those people. We have to have the local trade unions prepared to encircle it and stop any bailiffs. We have to organize. Um, and final thing I want to say is as part of this picture, uh, we've got a stall over there, but the, we've got this action charter, which is a five point plan. It's not perfect, but it's an attempt to bring the threads together. It deals with council housing, rent controls, and secure tenancies in the private rented sector, planning and developers. Um, and the idea is that we all sign up to it and we all, in different ways, and whatever your thing is, join in organizing for the day of action on the 8th of July, um, this Saturday. And it can be as small as standing outside a student block with a with posters saying, you're ripping us off, or as big as what's gonna happen at Pentonville and in various cities around the country. The point is you have to start and you have to organize and we have to win. Thank <laughs> you.